You got me into your house, you give me a drink, you put on music, now you start opening up your personal life to me and tell me your husband won't be home for hours. So? Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Movies like The Graduate helped make a legend of the late director, Mike Nichols. A man of many talents, he lived a life worthy of a movie all its own, as the author of a new biography tells us. A Mike Nichols film. Over 50 years, those words became something of a promise that we were about to see ourselves at our best. What do you need speech class for? You talk fine. At our worst. Look down. Oh. Touch that phone and I'll bite. And I got rabies. And at all those complicated, all too human places in between. Blood on my wig, on my clothes. All my makeup's come off. Do I have any eyebrows left? Mike's approach as a director was make it real, make it recognizable, and go toward the people, the talent, the actors, the writers that you love. His own tale began improbably, says Mark Harris, the author of a new biography about Nichols. Mike Nichols's life story is the story of someone who started with the odds pretty well stacked against him. As he explained to Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes, when he was born in Berlin in 1931, Nichols wasn't even his name. It was Michael Igor Peshkovsky, and my father was a doctor, and he was Russian. And when we came to this country, he said that by the time he spelled his name, the patient was in the hospital, so he changed <laughs> it. Nichols's Jewish family fled Nazi Germany just before World War II. Mike was just seven and spoke barely any English. Not only that. Mike was hairless. He had a childhood reaction to a vaccine that resulted in the loss of all of his hair and his inability to grow hair. He was bald for his whole life. He was bald since he was four years old. So a refugee, English as a second language, being bald from a very young age. I mean, he must have felt like an outsider. Yes, Mike later credited his style of comedy, which was very observational, with how much he had to learn how to be a kid and learn how to be an American by watching other kids. At the University of Chicago, he began coming into his own, performing in plays, and struck a near instant connection with fellow student Elaine May. Mike saw Elaine in a train station. He sat down and he pretended that he was a secret agent and she was a secret agent, and she picked right up on it. It was like two people discovering they spoke the same secret language and they were really inseparable after that. It was an improvisation. It was an improvisation before people would even use the word improvisation. Their brand of observational comedy soon made Nichols and May very famous. He and Elaine May were only in their mid to late 20s when they kind of took off overnight. It's just suicidally beautiful tonight. <laughs> their sketches, like this one about the awkward negotiations of two teens on a first date, became classics. They performed on Broadway, grew weary of the grind, and decided to part ways for a time. Nichols needed a new gig. Playwright Neil Simon needed help with his new comedy. Mike realizes that he's a director and this is what he's meant to be on day one of rehearsals for the first play he ever directed, Barefoot in the Park. Nichols directed Elizabeth Ashley and a young Robert Redford, not to play for laughs, but to play it as truthfully as possible. He wanted you to believe that you were watching two people almost spying on them in the privacy of their own sixth floor walk-up studio apartment. And that was something people really hadn't seen before. The play was a hit and Nichols won a Tony, then another for The Odd Couple. And at the ripe old age of 33, he headed west. For his film directing debut, he's directing two actors that were sort of famous. <laughs> right. The first time behind the camera. What a dump. Mike Nichols takes on Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Hey, what's that from? What a dump. How would I know? With oh, 
Indisputably, at that time, the world's most famous couple, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. How the heck did he even know what to do? Uh, Mike would say that he didn't know what to do. Oh, baby, aren't you something? Yet he wasn't shy about making demands, like filming his adaptation of the controversial play in black and white. A thousand years of you has been quite enough. But his bedside manner with his superstar couple ensured that the studio said yes. It was a critical and box office triumph. Oh, God. For his next film, The Graduate, Nichols cast an unknown, Dustin Hoffman, for his dark comedy about an aimless college grad having an affair with an older woman. Mrs. Robinson, do you think we could say a few words to each other first this time? I don't think we have much to say to each other. It won Nichols an Oscar and awakened a whole new generation of moviegoers. The Graduate, by the end of its run in theaters, it had become the third highest grossing movie in American history. It was by far the most important friendship that I, th I think I ever had. He was sort of the apotheosis of the arts and of wit and of generosity. How about it, Susan? What are you so afraid of? Not you. For 1971's sexually provocative carnal knowledge, Nichols cast his longtime friend Candace Bergen. I don't think I can do it. I was so young when I did Carl Knowledge, I didn't even know what it was about until I saw it again at Mike's house 10 years later, and I went, oh my God. By then, Nichols was accustomed to living large. He made a lot of money. He liked to do that. <laughs> okay. Caviar and foie gras and Chateau Ikem. He loved luxury, he loved affluence. And Arabian horses. I think he felt insulated by money. Mike Nichols had flops, more than a few, but the theater always welcomed him back. And I have an education, I got a PhD, I can't do shit with, you know? So I stay high so I don't get mad. He brought a little known Whoopi Goldberg to Broadway. After first seeing her perform in a tiny theater, Harris writes, Nichols went backstage to meet her and burst into tears. Sometimes people ask me, what makes Mike different than other directors? And loving talent so much that you burst into tears is a Mike thing. It's not a director thing. With 1983's Silkwood, Nichols began a longtime collaboration with Meryl Streep. He said, Meryl woke me up. What did he mean? When he started to work with Meryl Streep. An angel is a belief. I think he met an actor completely naturally in sync with his approach as a director. How do I make this real? When he was 56, Mike Nichols married, for the fourth time, journalist Diane Sawyer. There was the Mike before Diane and the Mike after Diane. She brought out the best in him, which was great. Everyone can see. And just when most careers begin slowing, his once again flourished. You do fussy, fussy, fussy. You do Martha Graham, Martha Graham, Martha Graham. Or the Birdcage was one of his biggest hits. You see before you a happy man. And in 2012, he won a Tony, his 10th, for directing Death of a Salesman. A salesman has got to dream. It goes with the territory. Thank you. By the time of his death two years later at 83, the outsider, who mined real life for comedic and dramatic gold, was the embodiment of the Hollywood A-list. And, says Candace Bergen, a cherished friend. A few of us had a dinner for him after he died, a celebration of Mike. And it was hard to keep it to 300 people. I mean, <laughs> really, we, we struggled. And every one of the people at the party, he had been instrumental in helping them in their career or in giving them money. He had been a very good friend. And you thought, wow, it, it wasn't just me? 